Hi there. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Whatever time it is, as always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. I'm Larry Erickson, your host. And for the next half hour, almost, I'm going to be talking about some things that uh, I think you should know about. Have any reactions to the show? You can email me directly. It's whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. It's my personal email. Uh, or you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time. You can leave a comment there or you can get the email address from there. If you do send me email, uh, please include something in the subject line that makes it clear it's not spam. And um, be a little patient about getting an answer because I'm lousy at answering email. But you will get an answer. All right, we're going to start, as I always like to, uh, whenever I can, with some good news. I got like three bits of good news actually to tell you about. First is that Antonio Weiss has withdrawn his name from consideration for nomination to a government post. Who's Antonio Weiss? He's a senior banker at the financial giant Lazard who had been proposed by President Hopi Chengji to become Undersecretary of Domestic Finance in the Treasury Department. This is the third highest ranking post in the department. His nomination was opposed by some of the more progressive members of the Senate, including Elizabeth Warren, who had denounced the revolving door between Wall Street and regulatory agencies and said about Weiss in particular that he's actually not qualified for this job because his background is in international, uh, international mergers, international corporate mergers, and his government post involves overseeing consumer protection and domestic regulation. Uh, also, the fact that if Lazard got the Treasury post, he stood to get paid $20 million do by Lazard if Weiss got the post um, because he did not go to another financial agency, uh, another financial group. That also rankled some people who figured that uh, since Lazard is one of the outfits that he would be responsible for regulating. Now, with six Dems openly opposing Weiss and uh, some others clearly wavering, uh, it got too hot for him, and uh, Obama's latest kowtow to Wall Street withdrew his name. Now, this doesn't mean that the next nominee from the White House will be any better, and it also doesn't mean that these Democrats, now having proven they can be tough, won't just roll over for whoever's name comes up next. Uh, but it does mean that, at least for now, you should take pleasure in the good news, the progressives actually won one. All right, next up. Uh, on Monday, January 12th, federal district court judge Karen Schreier ruled that the ban on same-sex marriage in South Dakota is unconstitutional. She wrote that the plaintiffs in the case have a fundamental right to marry, a right that the state was denying them, quote, solely because they are same-sex couples and without sufficient justification. There are six couples who are plaintiffs in the case. One of them uh, wants to get married in South Dakota. The other five couples want South Dakota to recognize their marriages, which are performed in other states. Now, the decision is, of course, stayed, as is common in these cases. It stayed pending a potential appeal to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals by South Dakota's State Attorney General Marty Jackley, who said that he is obligated to defend the state law. And uh, something I find interesting in this is that increasingly, when these appeals are undertaken, they're undertaken not on the grounds of this is a, an important law and it's important that we preserve the sanctity of marriage and all the rest of that nonsense. It's, they're undertaken under the claim that I am obligated to defend the law, which I think is a sign, again, of progress. Now, the last time the Eighth Circuit ruled on same-sex marriage, it upheld a ban on same-sex marriage in the state of Nebraska. But that was back in 2006, and a heck of a lot has changed in the time since. Now, at the moment that I'm doing this, there are five petitions uh, from states before the Supreme Court regarding same-sex marriage decisions at the circuit level. The court has not yet announced that it's going to take up any of these, but that could have changed by the time that you actually see this. Uh, and the court is expected to take up at least one of these cases before the, uh, uh, during the current session, rather. Um, one other thing uh, is, is something else that uh, eh, I call it good news. It's kind of limited good news, but on the whole, it has to be put on the plus side of the balance sheet. Um, 
After the Affordable Care Act, which is now also popularly known as Obamacare, was passed, there were several court challenges to, to the law, one of which involved the so-called individual mandate, the requirement that people have some kind of health insurance that meets certain minimum standards or they have to pay a tax penalty. Well, the suit that challenged this lost in district court in 2012. They lost at the Federal Court of Appeals in 2014. And on Monday, January 12th, they lost at the Supreme Court, which refused to accept the case. And that's the good news. Now, the reason this is limited good news is because I felt and still feel that Obamacare is not good enough. It's not up to the challenge which faces it. But uh, when the law is being uh, uh, debated, there are actually, according to polls, somewhere around 18 or 20 percent of Americans who oppose the law because it didn't go far enough. Uh, I was among those numbers. Because what we need, I say, is a national health care system, not national health insurance, national health care. Now, during the debate over the law, my concerns were dismissed by Obama's supporters who said, oh, no, no, don't be silly, we'll get this passed, and next year we'll come back to make it better. I said at the time that, no, you won't, you'll spend all your time and energy uh, defending what little you have gained, and I think history has shown which of us was right about that. Um, that, however, brings us to some not good news, which is that the Supreme Court has uh, uh, agreed to hear a different challenge to the Affordable Care Act, one that could cost millions of people their federal tax subsidies that are enabling them to afford health insurance. It's based on a bizarre sort of legalistic legalism. The act refers to states creating their own exchanges to provide subsidized insurance, like the Health Connector here in Massachusetts, and also says that where states don't do that, the feds will set up an exchange for that state. Well, apparently in one of these references to these exchanges, it only mentions the states, not the federal government, and these people are there arguing that therefore Congress never intended for there to be any federal exchanges and they all have to be shut down. So the millions of people who depend on them are just out of luck. Um, oral arguments in that challenge of the law are scheduled at the Supreme Court for March 4th. Uh, now, one other thing, an update on something I talked about last week, um, the Keystone XL pipeline. The House of Representatives has approved a bill to force approval of the pipeline, uh, one which, again, is designed to carry tar sands, which are about the most polluting source of oil that there is from uh, mines in Alberta, Canada, to refineries in Texas. Um, but I said Obama would veto the bill, if, if it passed the Senate as well, and that one reason they cited was the fact that the case about the pipeline's route was before the Nebraska Supreme Court. Well, on January 9th, the Nebraska Supreme Court upheld the law regarding the pipeline route. See, what happened is the legislature had passed a law stripping from the State Utilities Commission the authority to uh, established the pipeline route and is said giving it to the governor knowing full well that he would do whatever TransCanada, which is the company that wants to build the thing, that he would do whatever TransCanada wanted, which he promptly did. People sued saying the law was improper under the state constitution because of divisions of powers. They won in lower court, they won in appeals court, but at the state Supreme Court, they lost because even though a four to three majority of that court said the law should be struck down, Nebraska requires a supermajority of five to two in order to strike down the law. So the law was upheld, the route's been approved. Now the thing is, uh, and the reason why there's some good news here too, is that in reaction to the Nebraska decision, the White House repeated its statement that it will veto the bill if it passes the Senate. And this, this bill to force approval of this pipeline has enough votes in both the House and the Senate to get it passed, but not enough to overcome a veto. 
Now, some people have argued that Obama's real reason for this veto would be that um, it would strip from the executive branch the power to make the final decision on the pipeline. And so it's his turf, not an environmental principle, that Obama is defending. And it is true that Obama does not like challenges to either his authority or his, uh, uh, or his decisions. However, I have to say, this still does strike me as having the feel of Obama leaning, at least leaning toward rejecting this pipeline outright. Um, and if that happens, yeah, that would be good news. All right, from there we move to one of our regular weekly features. It's the Clown Award, given as always for meritorious stupidity. And this week, the winner of the Big Red Nose is somebody who already has a Big Red Nose, Rupert Murdoch. On Friday, Murdoch, who is the chair of uh, the News Corp, uh, he said via Twitter that even peaceful Muslims are responsible for jihadist cancer. He said, this is quoting him, maybe most Muslims, and he spelled it with an O, maybe most Muslims peaceful, but until they recognize and destroy the growing jihadist cancer, they must be held responsible. In other words, all Muslims are responsible for all acts of terror by, uh, by Muslims. In this case, Twitter did my work for me. Uh, uh, Murdoch was openly and soundly mocked. He was asked if he was responsible for everything from the Inquisition to violence in Northern Ireland to child molesting priests because he is a Christian. Uh, one of them asked for specifics on how uh, their 60-year-old parents in North Carolina, what they could do to stop jihadist terrorism. But my favorite response actually came from J.K. Rowling who said, this is quoting her, I was born Christian. If that makes Rupert Murdoch my responsibility, I'll auto-excommunicate. Rupert Murdoch is and always has been a total clown. And we're taking a break. And here we are back again. Uh, and to start the rest of the show, uh, first thing going to be one of our other regular features. It's the outrage of the week. This time it's not uh, a particular thing. It's rather a series of things that have happened over the past few months that are serving to illustrate a point I've tried to make before but is worth making again about the attack on what I call the commons. The idea that we are a society, a mutual responsibility uh, uh, that everybody has to each other and that um, everybody is part of this one thing. The first thing is back in October, uh, Paul LePage, the governor of Maine, proposed dealing with the unemployment faced by recent college grads by creating a system of what amounts to indentured servitude, where employers are get a tax break for employing uh, recent grads and paying off some of their student loans, in return for which that student would be bound to that company for three to five years, after which apparently they could be dumped without, of course, having worked that company enough time to have gained any real benefits um, as the company hires a different fresh young mind as LePage called them. The following month Wisconsin Governor Scott Walk All Over You defended his decision to not expand Medicaid in the state by saying this would help poor people in the state quote live the American dream unquote because they won't be quote dependent on the American government. This despite the fact that the majority of people who would benefit from the Medicaid expansion are in fact already working. Uh, more recently, Indiana Governor Mike Pence said that uh, by refusing to ask for a federal waiver in order to continue to provide food stamps for unemployed single people, a refusal which will result in about 65,000 people in the state losing their food stamp benefits. He said that by doing that, he was promoting work and therefore, he said, ennobling the poor. In Texas, we've seen a proposal to allow the majority of a 14-member Joint Legislative Committee on Nullification to have the power to supposedly suspend any federal law in the state, with the suspension becoming permanent if the action was ratified by the state legislature at its next session. Nullification, of course, is completely contrary to the U.S. Constitution, but we have yet to see if anybody in the Texas legislature actually cares. 
Finally, just a couple of weeks ago, we have a bill signed by Michigan Governor Rick Snidely Whiplash creating a drug testing program for adult welfare recipients. Uh, this was supposedly to protect their children. Recipients and applicants who are suspected of drug use will have to take a drug test and if you refuse to take the test you lose your benefits for at least six months. Uh, this is despite the fact, uh, the fact that experience with these programs in other states has shown them to be an expensive failure and that the rate of drug use among welfare recipients was actually lower than that of the general population. Now all these incidents may seem different, uh, but in fact they are linked in an ultimate intent, an intent that has become the hallmark of the right wing. That hallmark is the driving force behind these bills, which are, they have a transparent intent to throw people off assistance programs under the guise of doing them a favor. Because that driving force, that determination, what's actually producing these kind of things, is to find ways, find ways to justify not caring about other people. To justify not even a cold, but a bland, uh, emotionless indifference to the needs and welfare of others. To make those in need not just ill-considered, but unconsidered. And no, it has not always been this way. This is not new, but it is recent. Because this isn't merely greed. This isn't merely cut my taxes. This isn't merely small government. This isn't merely just bigotry. It goes beyond that to a basic concept of society, a basic worldview. This is not even hatred of government per se. It's a hatred of a concept of government as a means through which a people as a whole can act. It is a hatred of the concept of we the people. It's a hatred, most all, of the concept of the commonweal. It used to be that the rich, the powerful, the elite, they would temper their despising of those in need with a little noblesse oblige. Increasingly, they want to be freed from even that as they express a new social version of the banality of evil. And that surely is an outrage. All right, I'm going to take the rest of the show talking about something else. You know, I'm sure, about the terrorist attack that took place on January 7th on the French satirical publication Charlie Hebdo. And those of you, I'm sure, that speak French are now laughing at my, uh, my attempt to uh, pronounce the name properly, but I don't care. Uh, in English, it looks like Charlie Hebdo. Twelve people were killed, eleven more were wounded in the attack, five more were killed, and ten more wounded during the three-day hunt for the murderers. And the dead, those dead do not count the three murderers themselves who were killed by French police. It was the deadliest act of terrorism in France in over 50 years. The cause, apparently, supposedly, was the uh, magazine's habit of publishing cartoons mocking Islam and General Muhammad in particular. And that seems a reasonable conclusion. The attackers did shout Alu Akbar, which is Arabic for God is great, uh, during the attack. And the group Al-Qaeda in, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula later claimed responsibility for the attack, although um, it appears US, U.S. intelligence sources and European intelligence sources say there's actually no evidence that they actually directed the attack, that maybe they were the inspiration for it, but not uh, directed it. In the days since the attack, though, the phrase, and I'm gonna, again, I'm going to try to pronounce the French correctly, uh, Je suis Charlie. Uh, which means I am Charlie. Uh, it's become a rallying cry for free speech and more particularly for the recognition that free speech must include the right to be rude, crude, and insulting. But it's also sparked, and I don't know what to call it, you can call it a conversation, an argument, a dispute, a, a uh, whatever, um, an argument about the, the limits, not the legal limits, but the ethical limits of free speech. The limits are for what, for a lack of a better term, I'll call acceptable speech. Again, not legally acceptable, ethically acceptable. Um, and I don't even mean like, you know, responsible speech. No, I mean acceptable, ethically acceptable speech. And are there limits? And if so, what are they? Because this is not the first time for this magazine. Uh, 
Okay, this magazine makes a practice of this. It calls itself irresponsible and atheistic and makes a regular habit of mocking religion and religious figures, often in very crude ways. For example, they have published cartoons of nuns performing oral sex. And it's not even the first time the magazine's been attacked by disturbed wackos fantasizing that they were defending their religion. In 2011, the, offices, uh, uh, the magazine's offices were firebombed after running a spoof issue guest edited by the Prophet Muhammad. In the time since, the magazine has published a number of caricatures of Muhammad, and which we're getting to the point where it starts to get sticky for two reasons that I'll, that I'll talk about. One is that the magazine is deliberately provocative. I mean, it, it deliberately provocative. Um, and I, by the way, I discovered something which I did not know. I learned this a few days ago. There's actually no ban in the Quran on images of the Prophet. Those bans appear in the Hadith which are the collections of what are supposed to be the teachings, deeds, the sayings of Muhammad, but uh, not in the Quran. Uh, and there's more than one version of the Hadith, by the way. But despite that, a lot of people accept the Hadith as authoritative parts of their religion and believe it's offensive, inherently offensive, to have any image of Muhammad, even a very respectful one. Now, I think it's not being Muslim, it's kind of hard for us to understand the, the depth of offense that this could give to Muslims. Um, but try to imagine the reaction of a devout Catholic to a cartoon of, again, nuns performing oral sex. And then imagine that in your religion there is a prohibition on any depiction of nuns at all. The magazine this magazine seeks to provoke that kind of outrage, consciously and deliberately. Now, by the way, i got to do a quick aside because I know some people are going to be thinking this, some people are going to be saying this, going to say, I'm trying to blame the victim. No, I'm not. Offense, no matter how profound, no matter how deep, does not justify violence. It does not justify attacks. It does not justify firebombs. It does not justify murder. I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Famous quote, often attributed to Voltaire, but it actually came from the woman who wrote his bi a biography of him. The point is, we are not required to agree with or to approve of uh, Charlie Ebda's uh, brand of giggling sophomoric mockery in order to condemn the attack. The question again is, what is acceptable? Uh, not legally, uh, more, uh, legally acceptable, but ethically acceptable. By the way, uh, something I want to get in here right here is that um, you've got to realize that despite what you may think, Christians are not immune to this sort of outrage on, on behalf of their religion. I mean, consider first the, the, you know, the, the abortion murders, the fire bombings, the shootings. Okay, that uh, done in on the claim that you know, this is defending Christianity. There's also something, you, you may not know about this, but look it up. There is a photograph by an American uh, artist named Andreas Serrano, um, and the actual name of it is Immersion Piss Christ. That's the actual name. He did a series of photographs about um, like, like uh, uh, classical statuettes submerged in some kind of liquid. And in this one, it was a small plastic crucifix uh, immersed in a jar of what he said was his own urine. Now, if you didn't, he didn't tell you that in the title and in his description, you couldn't tell that it was urine. It looks sort of this sort of rich amber color, because sort of a mysterious look to the to the crucifix. But this provoked outrage when they, when it was shown when the print was shown in New York in 1989. There were U.S. senators denouncing him. He got death threats and hate mail. He lost uh, grants because of this. Um, when it was shown in Australia in 1997, uh, there were attempts to get the uh, get the museum legally barred from showing it. Somebody tried to rip it off the wall, and two other people attacked it with a hammer, and the show was canceled because of it. And in April 2011, uh, a print of it was shown at a museum in Avignon, France, and was damaged beyond repair by two people avowedly in, uh, in reference to their Christian beliefs. So don't imagine that Christians are immune to this. But anyway, get back to the issue. Uh, the magazine, 
in France. French magazine uh, effectively takes the position in terms of what's acceptable, that nothing is off limits, that anything goes, anything is within the proper bounds. All right, well, in response to that, a cartoonist in the uh, British newspaper, The Guardian, did a multi-panel cartoon. He said, well, if that's true, if anything's acceptable, how about this? And he had a cartoon of a naked black man falling out of a tree in Africa holding a banana. Is that acceptable, he said? What about this one? He had a cartoon of a stereotypical, cliché, uh, anti-Semitic picture of a Jew with, you know, the big nose, clutching money, and all the rest of that. Is that acceptable, if anything goes? Here's the one that I thought of. I want you to imagine a cartoon that shows a young black male shooting a cop with the caption, I feared for my life, he reached for his waistband. Are any of those acceptable? Because if you say any of them are not acceptable, they're beyond the bounds of what you should, not what you legally can or can't, but what you properly should print, then you're saying that not everything is acceptable. In fact, even Shirley Ibda thinks that, because in 2009, they actually fired a writer for writing an anti-Semitic article. And here's the other reason I have problems with the magazine. It engages in mockery and ridicule. They are important and vital weapons. They are when you are punching up, not when you're punching down. This is a French magazine printed in French for a French audience. And in French, Muslims are still a small minority. You want to punch up in France, attack the Catholic Church, attack Christianity. That's punching up. You attack Muslims, especially on a regular basis, and, and attack their culture and their religion, you are punching down. You are punching the weak. And that's wrong. It's wrong morally, it's wrong ethically. Also because punching down does not promote any form of freedom except the freedom to be an obnoxious jerk. What punching down does is promote and provoke bigotry. Europe today is seeing a reemergence of bigotry, not just anti-Muslim, anti-Semitic bigotry. In an atmosphere like that, you need to be extra careful about who your targets are. Not, again, not because of fear of the law, not because of fear of attack, but because of just is your wanting to be a decent human being. The magazine actually has made what I think is an effort, a clear effort in that case, this is the cover of the new issue. This is the cover. What the top, what that means is all is forgiven. I think they made a good uh, case on this. Uh, they're also trying to capitalize it. Uh, their, their, their press run for this issue is 50 times their, uh, their normal run. But I think what this cover did is that the magazine found a way to be true to itself while still expressing sh some understanding of the world in which they live. That's it. We're done. Uh, I'm out of here. We'll see you next week. Have the best week you can. Peace.